Formed in 1985, White Zombie's sound would undergo a metamorphosis during their career from noise rock to more heavy metal sound, and it would achieve them a lot of success during the early to mid-90s. But by the end of the decade, the band called it quits, and today we're going to talk about why White Zombie broke up. Rob Zombie would spend his formative years in Haverville, Massachusetts, a depressed industrial outpost where Zombie spent most of his time hanging out at cemeteries. He would be pretty antisocial as a kid, having different interests from his peers, telling the LA Times, I grew up with really normal straight parents, but they let me and my brother do anything we wanted to do. They took us to see A Clockwork Orange and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I remember seeing like Phantom of the Opera when I was five years old and he would spend nearly eight hours a day watching TV and it soon became a future obsession for him. This eventually led Rob to go down the road of making his own Super 8 films. But apart from television, he would also develop a taste for larger than life musical acts, including Kiss, Blue Oyster Cult and Alice Cooper. And couple this with his love of the DIY ethos of punk rock and Rob Zombie had the basic blueprint for White Zombie. The group would form when bassist Shawnee Salt and frontman Rob Zombie both met while attending the Parsons School of Design. The band's first drummer was also a student at the same school. Salt would reveal in the book Louder Than Hell, Rob and I were both oddballs. I think we were drawn to each other. We started the band within a month of meeting and basically lived together for seven years. We both had dyed black hair and he had a stenciled Misfits leather jacket. I had a bunch of animal bones tied onto a necklace. The pair would end up dating, but they would break up by the 90s with the salt telling the Chicago Tribune. The whole band and the business just got so much bigger than any relationship. The group would also have a variety of drummers during this time and found a guitarist named Jay Younger, who went by the name Jay. White Zombie would be the amalgamation of two different music scenes. You had the noise rock scene of New York City, which famously included groups like Sonic Youth, and then they were also the combination of the hardcore scene in DC that included bands like Minor Threat, Bad Brains, and Dave Grohl's pre-Nirvana band Scream. To Rob, he had the goal of not only giving fans a spectacular music video for their songs, but he also wanted to give fans an equally impressive live show with the group rigging their own pyro, despite how dangerous it may sound. White Zombie would sign to label Caroline Records, who put out their first two releases, 1987's Soul Crusher and 1989's Make Them Die Slowly. But the road to gain recognition was a long one. The band's first release, Soul Crusher, seemed to go unnoticed or was simply misunderstood. With the salt revealing in Louder Than Hell, people didn't really get it. We would play a lot of those things together. We would play this really heavy music in clubs in the East Village and all these hipsters just stared at us and scratched their heads. The reviews would also echo a similar sentiment, but it was the band's detractors that drove Rob Zombie to push forward. And while the sales weren't really there for the group's first album, it did find an audience with some pretty accomplished musicians at the time, including Kurt Cobain, Iggy Pop, and Thurston Moore of Sonic Youth. White Zombie soon built up a crowd of followers at venues including CBGB's, and they started playing metal clubs, widening their audience. And by the early 90s, they would soon nab a recording contract with major label Geffen Records, and the band would move out west to Los Angeles. The group's first record for Geffen was 1992's La Sexorcisto Devil Music Volume 1, which would be a slow burn. Entertainment Weekly would publish an article in October of 1993 that highlighted the album had only moved about 75,000 copies before one of the singles, which was Welcome to the Planet Mud, was featured on the MTV hit show Beavis and Butthead. Rob would tell Entertainment Weekly, the record immediately started picking up in markets where we never played, like Wyoming and Missouri, places where Beavis and Butthead was the only thing happening. The help from Beavis and Butthead soon pushed sales to 300,000 copies by the fall of 1993, and the album would also be helped by the single Thunder Kiss 65, and at the end of the day, the album sold about 2 million copies. It was by 1994 that White Zombie headed back into the studio, enlisting Pantera producer Terry Date, and they would end up making the album that defined their career. And while it would be their commercial peak, it also spelt the end of the band. New drummer John Tempesta, formerly of Exodus and Testament, would join them in the studio, along with keyboardist Charlie Clauser. 
the resulting record Astro Creep 2000, Songs of Love, Destruction, and other synthetic delusions of the electric head would see the band wearing more industrial influences on their sleeve. Also, the songwriting process had changed from their previous efforts. Guitarist Jay Younger would typically write his riffs from scratch, but this time around, he was writing riffs to electronic rhythms, and soon enough, Rob was taking a greater control over the creative process. This would, of course, lead to escalating tensions. Rob would reveal in the book Louder Than Hell, when we recorded the last record, I don't think the four of us were in the studio at any point. I would write on a separate bus at all times, separate dressing rooms. It was four people who didn't work at all. On the outside, it looked so f great, and on the inside, it sucked. Released at just the right time, grunge had largely died the year before, as Alice in Chains were limping along, Pearl Jam was embroiled in a fight with Ticketmaster, and Nirvana was done. The resulting album proved to be the biggest of the group's career, moving a whopping 3 million copies, thanks in large part to the smash hit More Human Than Human, which took home MTV's best hard rock video. White Zombie's tour for the record would be their last. The band would co-headline along with Pantera, with I Hate God also on the bill. In 1996, an album of remixes was released under the title Super Sexy Swinging Sounds, and the band would also make one last song for the film Beavis and Butthead Do America, but they were basically done. Esalt would recall how despite the internal turmoil, she knew a breakup was coming, but she was still surprised at how all of it went down, revealing, first of all, I knew that we were breaking up. It wasn't a big surprise, but it was a little bit of a slap in the face to me and Jay. After one year, we were supposed to be taking a break, and then we were going to have a call and talk about getting back together and making a record. I knew that we weren't getting back together, but literally the next day Jay and I said, we have more riffs and we'd love to write some more music, and Rob kept saying, no, 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 I think we're done. Even though our manager told Jay and I that we should go on and continue on with White Zombie and get a new singer, we both refused that. But the slap in the face was that Rob's solo record came out like the next day, so we spent the year making a record knowing that White Zombie wasn't going to be a band again. It was in 1998 that Rob would release his first solo record, Hellbilly Deluxe, and many already saw the writing on the wall, which was only confirmed by an official breakup announcement the same year. But Esalt would reveal another element that contributed to the band's demise in the book Louder Than Hell, stating, The end for White Zombie came because Rob wanted the band to be a little more techno. Rob can be really controlling. Whoever's on his team, it's them against the world. Once Jay and I didn't want to go along with him creatively, he kind of considered us against them. Younger would echo these sentiments in a separate interview stating, and I quote, As time went on, the sampling and techno stuff started to dominate everything, and I really hated it. Now you can hear how little humanity is in Rob's stuff. Zombie in a lot of the press interviews he's given since the band's breakup talked about his career aspirations of being a director of horror films and wanting to pursue other interests. But he also chalked up White Zombie's split to him being simply bored. Rob would also take some shots at his former bandmates, adding to the LA Times, they wanted to be taken seriously as musicians. All of a sudden they wanted to be like Jeff Beck or Eric Clapton, and I was like, screw that. I mean, why do I care what critics think about me? Everything I love has always been hated by the critics. But Esalt would shoot back in a separate interview, calling Zombie's assertion, and I quote, a flat out lie, adding, Rob wanted to do his own thing and we were fine with it. He can tell people as many lies as he wants, but would I be running around in a costume playing Surf Garage if I wanted to be taken as seriously like Jeff Beck? In the years since the breakup, the other members of White Zombie would play in new bands, and as to whether a reunion is still possible after all these years, Rob has been pretty adamant it isn't in the cards. He's repeatedly said that he would worry that a reunion wouldn't live up to expectations, and that his audience at his solo tour shows are noticeably younger and probably aren't familiar with White Zombie's music, and is even admitted to slowly taking White Zombie songs out of their set list. Rob would go on to reveal that since the breakup, he hasn't spoken to most of the members. It was in 2016 that the ex-members of White Zombie had to collaborate, albeit through managers on their box set called It Came From NYC, which featured a lot of the band's early material. What could have sparked a reunion only resulted in more tensions. It would be music journalist Grayson Haver Curran who wrote the liner notes for the box set telling The Observer in 2016 that Rob waited until the last minute to contribute to the liner notes, which pushed deadlines, recalling, so I finally put together the liner notes and he had a fair deal of changes. It was mainly in reference to things that made him look bad, which was pretty much everything everyone else had to say about him. 
it was clear Rob Zombie was not going to compromise on his points. The liner notes were totally approved and in production and he pulled them back basically. That concludes today's video guys. Thanks for watching. If you guys want to submit requests on topics you'd like to see me cover, use the link in the description box below and we'll see you again in Rock and Roll True Stories.